And here we go, chapter four, uh, propagation antennas and feed lines. Hold on just a second, I want to get my laser pointer going, okay. Um, this is uh, really into some good red meat to the subject matter. Um, probably the most important topic uh, for putting together and operating a good successful ham station. Um, so in this chapter, uh, when you read it, uh, they covered how radio signals travel from place to place, uh, some basic ideas about antennas, uh, how feed lines are constructed and used, and what SWR, or standing wave ratio, is and what it means to you. So that was covered in the book. Um, I'm going to go into uh, these so the same topics, but maybe from a little different uh, perspective. Um, I always say that uh, in ham radio, like a lot of things, there is no magic. It's all math and physics. So um, I think if uh, we can get a little basic understanding of some of the math and physics involved, uh, stand a pretty good chance of um, um, doing quite well with your antennas and uh, your feed lines and such. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, like I said, we'll start with uh, some good uh, fundamentals and uh, there won't be any math uh, this will just be um, you've probably seen some of this stuff in your uh, science classes in school but we'll go back to the very basics and uh, kind of build from that point so the first thing we want to look at is uh, the, some basic science used in uh, antennas design and operation and one of the concepts is that of electromagnetic induction and uh, what we've got here is a look at uh, what happens when you take a magnet that has a north and south pole and move it inside of a coil or a loop of wires and what we find is that if the magnet is just uh, sitting there not moving uh, we don't read anything um, on the galvanometer which measures uh, small currents uh, but if we move the magnet while the magnet is moving, uh, we find that we induce a magnetic uh, current in this circuit. And then if we move the magnet back through the other way, then we find that we induce a magnetic current, but it flows in the opposite direction. So if we take this magnet, move it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, what we're going to see on the meter is the meter is going to go plus and minus, plus and minus. And the thing to really keep in mind here is the reason for that current flow isn't the magnet or the coil, but it's the change in the magnetic field. It's when the magnetic field moves and uh, cross cuts through the coil that we induce, induce the circuit. So uh, when we say change, that means the position is uh, changing or the magnetic field is changing but as that magnetic field changes the current flowing in this circuit changes so that's a real key concept so if you think about uh, when we look at antennas think about the uh, the antenna element being uh, the coil and uh, the electromagnetic signal coming in as the magnet and it's uh, changing the electromagnetic electromagnetic field on that antenna element and that in turn induces a current in the antenna element um, so again it's the current and then if you take um, current flow in a wire say if you've got two batteries here um, and you pass a, a current through this uh, circuit you'll generate a magnetic field and then if you change the polarity of the current it reverses the magnetic field so if you flop these batteries back and forth plus and minus plus and minus the magnetic field is going to flop flip flop back and forth as the current is changing so in this case we're using a magnetic field to induce a current that's what happens when an antenna receives a signal and here we take a current control a current and we induce a magnetic field that we can change by changing the current so it's kind of uh, uh, you know two sides of a nickel there um, uh, so uh, this is just a uh, a real key 
uh, basic concept to understanding antennas. So again, the, uh, the coil here acts as uh, the antenna element, or the antenna element actually acts like the coil in this case. And if we vary an electromagnetic field uh, across that antenna element, we're going to induce a alternating current in that circuit. And here, so that's how we receive. And then to transmit, what we're doing is we're driving a current uh, through a wire and generating a magnetic field. And as we control the forward and reverse of that current, we're controlling the direction of that magnetic field. So the, the higher the current, the stronger the field, uh, the lower the current, the weaker the field. And that's how the signal's modulated. So we can uh, adjust this uh, radiating magnetic field by adjusting the current in the um, wire or the element of the uh, antenna. Now, another uh, concept that um, helps explain how antennas work is electromagnetic induction in a transformer. Now, what a transformer is, is if we have a, a coil of wire on one side of an iron uh, core, and this is just a uh, specially designed uh, block of iron, and on the other side, of the iron block, we have another coil with a different number of turns. You can see there are more turns here than there are here. So what the purpose of a transformer is, is to change or transform the voltage from one voltage here to another voltage here. And the way it does that is that you pass the current through the primary, this side of the transformer. And because remember, we're moving current through a wire, we're going to generate a magnetic field, and the magnetic field is going to travel through the iron core and uh, come over here. And keep in mind, again, what we have here is we have a moving magnetic field moving over um, a coil. So the changes in this magnetic field here are going to cause changes, going to induce current in this coil. Uh, so we can have current flow out here. So we've got current flow flowing in here, current flow flowing out here, and it's coupled by this, uh, the magnetic flux is coupled by this iron core. Now this is how a transformer works, and uh, probably the one most common uh, transformer you may be familiar with is if you go outside of your house and find the, uh, the power pole, you'll see a... Um, uh, a can uh, with some wires coming out of it could be a fairly good sized can and that's the transformer and what's happening there is the uh, the line voltage coming in from the power company is connected on this side and oh maybe it's in the 12 13 thousand volt range and then this transformer will by the turn the uh, different number of turns here compared to here will lower that 13 thousand volts to 240 volts AC that comes into your house. Um, so it's uh, it's taking the uh, the energy from the lines, driving a current. The current generates a magnetic flux. The magnetic flux comes over here and induces a current into this secondary coil, and uh, we get that uh, voltage and current transformation. Okay, now the reason I talked about a transformer is that there's a, a very similar uh, relationship in um, radio transmission and receiving. Um, where what we're doing in a, an antenna is that we're going to pass current through an antenna element to generate an electromagnetic field. Uh, the electromagnetic field is uh, transmitted, travels through the air through receiving trans or trans to a receiver and these variations in the electromagnetic field are going to induce a current in the uh, receiving antenna and that's how we transfer the information from a transmitting station to receiving an, its um, a station so um, it's uh, the same type of concept where we're uh, 
using electromagnetic energy transmission and receiving um, to get the desired effect. Okay, now another basic science concept uh, that's helpful in understanding how antennas work is uh, the ionosphere. Um, the ionosphere is uh, uh, different layers in our atmosphere. Uh, it goes anywhere from 30 to 200 miles above the surface of the Earth. And uh, this is the uh, primary conduit of uh, uh, transmitting electromagnetic waves for radio signals in the HF range in particular. That would be from uh, uh, 160 meters uh, up to 10 meters, uh, maybe 6 meters um, in that range. Now, the, the thing with the, the ionosphere is that there are actually multiple layers of uh, the ionosphere. Starting here on Earth, uh, the stratosphere is uh, anywhere from 6 to 30 miles. And you can see that most of the um, Earth weather is down in this area. And it's a, a very small distance from the Earth to the top edge of where the weather um, happens. And an awful lot of what happens with the radio waves happens above that. Um, if you go up a little uh, above the stratosphere, there's a D layer. Uh, this is a pretty dense layer in the ionosphere, and it can absorb um, quite a bit of electromagnetic energy during the day uh, when the sun's activating it. Uh, and so that it can attenuate uh, radio transmitted signals. At night, that tends, tends to fade out. Uh, then there's an E layer, uh, and then there are two F layers. There's an F1 layer. Uh, that forms during the day and the F2 layer uh, is dominant uh, in the evening and in the uh, at night both of these combine so you end up with a, a combined uh, just one F layer and what happens is that when you transmit uh, a signal it'll be radiated up into the sky and will reflect off the ionosphere and then come back down to a receiving station. So that's referred to as uh, uh, skip uh, transmission. And you can see why you would call it skip because the signal comes up, skips over this part of the earth, and it can be heard here. And that's why, for example, during the day, um, it's not then um, likely to find 20 meters uh, you're able to work the west coast from here in Pennsylvania, um, but the stations between here and, Pen and uh, California can't be heard, and they can't hear you because your signal's skipping over them and going out further. And uh, this is this angle uh, of refraction back to the Earth is very dependent on frequency. So you'll find that 40 meters, for example, during the day will have a uh, steeper angle and it'll come down closer to uh, where you're at so that's one reason we have multiple um, frequency bands so that depending on conditions you can uh, by selecting different bands uh, operate in different parts of uh, the world and then here's a look at the ionosphere and um, if the uh, showing how the frequency um, dependence uh, is uh, done in the, the ionosphere, if you get too high of a frequency, rather than the signal being bent or refracted or bounced back to the Earth, it'll keep going out into space uh, so you don't get any return signal. And this is generally at a higher frequency. Let's say, for example, VHF and UHF are both basically line of sight communications where uh, you can pretty well communicate uh, from a line of sight of the antenna to the uh, transceiver. Um, but you really can't get distance on it because, the, because of the higher frequency, the frequencies don't bend by the ionosphere and they just go out into uh, space and uh, uh, you can't um, 
people out here can't uh, pick that up. So the whole ionic ionosphere bouncing is kind of a, a dynamic uh, situation. It's always changing. Um, it's not uncommon to be working a station and hear them fade in and out uh, as you're talking to them. And that's because all the, uh, uh, well, we don't want that. The ionosphere um, up here is constantly changing because it's being energized by the sun's uh, radiation, both light and ultraviolet and infrared and all everything that's coming here, as well as uh, magnetic particles. So um, don't don't think of the atmosphere as something static. Um, it's it's very dynamic, constantly changing, and uh, adds to a lot of the uncertainty and fun in uh, ham radio. Okay, another uh, concept that you have to think of a little differently uh, when we're talking about antennas is the uh, the concept of gain. Now, normally when you think of gain, uh, you might think about the uh, the volume control on your radio or the uh, uh, power control on a stereo amplifier. And what happens there is you increase the uh, the gain, uh, you're increasing the magnitude of the signal. It's getting louder and louder. Um, when we're talking about antenna gain, uh, the actual power is uh, for a particular antenna at a, at a particular frequency is pretty well fixed. Um, you're going to be able to only get so much power out um, so that uh, you're really not changing. Uh, if you're um, changing the gain of the antenna, you're really not changing the total power out. What you can do, though, is that you can concentrate the signal in one direction or another. So um, some concepts here is uh, an omnidirectional antenna, omni meaning one or all. So this is an antenna that radiates a signal equally in uh, all the in every horizontal direction. So if you think about throwing a, a rock into a pond and those ripples that come out, in concentric circles, that would be an omnidirectional antenna type pattern. You're going to get the same signal magnitude coming out in all directions. Whereas another type of antenna that uh, can focus the power uh, in a single direction or a beam is referred to as a directional antenna. And we'll take a look at some examples there uh, as we get into different antenna configurations. Uh, so an antenna's gain is measured in decibels. Uh, without getting into the math, I'll just say that decibels are the way antenna's gain is measured. You'll probably, uh, if you go on to the general class, we'll get into that a little deeper, uh, the meaning of decibels and how they're calculated. And uh, particularly when you're looking at, uh, say, antennas in a catalog or web page. Uh, one thing you're going to want to check out is the uh, the antenna's gain. They usually publish that kind of data. And there are two references for uh, an antenna's gain. It will either be specified as DBD, which means it's the gain relative to a dipole antenna, or DBI, and that is the gain relative to what's called an isotropic antenna. Now, an isotropic antenna is a, a theoretical antenna. It can't be built, uh, but it's represented as one point in space. So that an isotropic antenna, if it could be built and operated, it would have, its radiating power pattern would be a sphere coming out from the uh, single point in space. And then the uh, we'll look shortly at the uh, radiation pattern of a dipole uh, but the uh, the dipole uh, gain will is different than the uh, isotropic antenna. So the thing there's a, I think it's either 2.3 or 2.7 decibels between the DBI and the DBD. But the thing to be aware of is that when you're looking at uh, uh, antenna gains, make sure you're either looking at uh, DBD based on the dipole's antenna peak gain or DBI, the intrinsic uh, or isotropic uh, antenna. And uh, if they're 
different units then you have to make the conversion so you're you get them on the same units and then uh, you can compare antenna gains that way okay this is uh, our first look at a uh, antenna um, propagation uh, chart and the one on the left here uh, may be a little uh, confusing but the uh, uh, what you're doing here is uh, azimuthal, I think that's how it's pronounced, pattern. Uh, what that means is you're looking down from overhead, like you're up on a drone looking down at the antenna on the ground. And uh, then the uh, circle around here is the uh, direction. So uh, this could be north, east, south, and west. <coughs> And then what this plot is, is the gain at each position as you move around in this direction. So your maximum gain is here. And in this case, uh, the maximum gain of 0 dB. Um, and then as you come around, save the antennas here, as you're moving around the antenna, the gain or the signal intensity drops off until you have a null right behind it. There's, there's no radiated energy going out this way. So most of your radiated energy for this antenna is directed out in this direction. So that's what it would look like from the top. And then if you come down on the ground, then you look at this elevation pattern. Uh, this is what you would see now the uh, numbers going out here this is a zero degrees so it's horizontal this is the horizon and as you start coming up in height you come up to where you're directly overhead and uh, this would be the uh, the most vertical position you would be in and then you come back down to the ground and you can see that the signal strength for this antenna is highest here these are called lobes uh, so the uh, highest strength signal will be at this these points here going in that direction and if you think about the ionosphere up there uh, your effective range uh, and overall operation of the antenna is determined can be determined greatly influenced by the angle of these lobes so there's a lot of work that goes into uh, understanding these lobes uh, so you can have a better understanding of where your propagation uh, is going and then you can see this lobe on the top and what that means is that there's energy going straight up um, and even as you come off of uh, perfectly vertical you still have radiation uh, being uh, propagated up and uh, that may not be all bad because there are some modes we'll get into where this type of propagation is actually helpful for uh, close in communication. But this generally shows you the intensity of the energy uh, from the side view of the antenna. And then, uh, so that's the elevation pattern. So now we're going to look at three different types of uh, antennas. Uh, these are probably the most common ones you'll see. There are a lot of, a lot of other types. Uh, there's tons of different antenna designs, but these are three of the primary uh, designs you might encounter. Uh, the first one is the half wavelength vertical. Um, it's an omnidirectional antenna. Uh, it's typically uh, one half wavelength long so you would have different lengths for different uh, frequencies or different bands and there has to be a perfect electric conductor uh, as the base and we'll get into the real world aspect of that because there is no say, such thing as a perfect electrical conductor uh, but essentially the thing to remember on an omnidirectional antenna is this is the propagation uh, pattern in three dimensions where the antenna is going right down the center and goes to the ground right here and what we see is like a big donut uh, going all around that antenna for the gain 
uh, of the antenna and the uh, the signal intensity. Now a dipole is an antenna that has a feed line and two equal length elements um, that come out to a half a wavelength. And uh, the propagation pattern that that kind of antenna gives us is it's the same a similar donut but because this is vertical and in this case the dipole is horizontal that donut is rotated 90 degrees so it's kind of riding like a tire here and you can see the uh, the relative gain uh, around that antenna so um, if you're transmitting um, the same power if you're radiating the same power on this dipole and the uh, vertical the the total energy between them aren't going to change uh, it's just the concentration of the uh, energy uh, is uh, what determines the gain and then finally the another uh, very common antenna is called a Yagi or a directional Yagi and the way it's manufactured is it essentially starts up as a dipole with one element here and then there will be another element a special distance away from that driven dipole this is where the radio is connected uh, to this element called a reflector and that's usually uh, uh, just a piece of aluminum uh, could be copper or any conductor and it's mounted to a mast and then on set dimensions on this side are what's called directors and these are a little bit shorter than the radi radiating element whereas the reflector is usually a little longer and they're set a certain distance apart out this way now what happens is when you energize this uh, driven element here being a horizontal uh, dipole you're going to get this radiation pattern from this element here and then what happens is this being a special distance away what happens when you uh, move an electromagnetic field through a conductor you generate a current flow so this driver driven uh, element is inducing a current in this uh, element which is aluminum or whatever the conductor is and because we're moving a current in this element it generates a, a uh, propagation pattern or a radiation pattern like this uh, it'll be lower in magnitude because it's not driven but it's picking up the energy from this element generates this shape around here this one's doing the same thing this one doing the same thing this one doing the same thing this one doing the same thing so the net effect is you're taking a series of these lobes here and stacking them up and coming up with a um, directional uh, lobe uh, that's a pretty high gain in this direction now the practical aspect of this is that by turning this antenna and the uh, it's not uncommon to have a rotator on a, a Yagi antenna like this. You can rotate in the direction of where you're trying to uh, contact and concentrate a lot of your radiated energy in that direction. So let's say if you're doing 100 watts here and you're doing 100 watts here, you can get more of that 100 watts that's available in the direction you want to go. Uh, so you can uh, send farther. Uh, you can receive better because the, uh, the uh, reception will be enhanced the same as the transmission is. So you're getting very good uh, distance and uh, power levels at the receiving end, but Mother Nature doesn't give you anything. So what you lose is you can't send or hear in these directions. There's no signal out here so you won't pick up any stations out in this area now that's kind of a double-edged sword you, you can't get those stations but the other thing you can't get is noise from out here whereas this vertical antenna and the horizontal dipole antenna 
um, when it's in receive mode, it'll receive noise from everywhere it can see. Um, so it, these tend to be noisier than a directional antenna. The trade-off here is you don't get as much coverage, but you can focus the energy and the uh, listening power in a particular direction. So that's um, ways you can, um, with different antenna designs, um, either have an omnidirectional propagation pattern or a directional propagation pattern. And generally on the Aggie, the more elements you have, the narrower this beam is and the higher the gain is. So uh, if you see a Yagi with a, uh, uh, you know, some of the VHF Yagis I've seen, I think you can have like 12, 14 elements. Uh, they're really trying to concentrate that beam in a uh, pretty narrow region uh, to get out as far as they can. So that's getting you used to kind of looking at uh, propagation patterns a little bit. And this is right out of the book. Um, it just shows the different types of uh, uh, coax and ladder line that might be used uh, to connect an antenna to a transceiver. Uh, coax generally has a center conductor uh, surrounded by insulation and a braid um, on the outside. Uh, so this is this is an example of double shielded where there are two shields. There's a foil shield and a braid shield. Uh, this is a rigid hard line. This is actually like a pipe. Um, it's not flexible. Uh, it's used uh, more so in uh, repeaters and uh, commercial uh, stations, that kind of thing. And then this is a semi-flexible hard line. Uh, probably the most basic uh, uh, coax you'll use is a single uh, shield uh, coax, and there's a lot of different grades uh, on that. And we'll get into more details on that in the general class. And then there are uh, what's referred to as ladder lines. Uh, these coaxes typically have 50 ohm characteristic impedance. Um, the ladder lines are different in that this type of, uh, call this a window ladder line, uh, where there's two parallel wires uh, with uh, plastic separating them with little windows, uh, 450 ohms. And then this is a 300 ohm uh, twin lead. And if you're as old as I am, uh, you'll remember this as the antenna wire for TVs uh, back when you were a kid. So uh, that's just kind of an overview of some of the coax cables. Now, the next thing we're going to take a look at is standing wave ratio or abbreviated SWR. And it's probably the most commonly used uh, measurement uh, to gauge the performance of an antenna. Um, it's a good indicator, but it's by no means the only indicator. And the uh, thing to keep in mind is that there's more to it than uh, having a good antenna than just a good SWR. Uh, but generally, if you don't have good SWR, it's not going to work well for you. So just because you have good SWR doesn't mean you have the best setup. Uh, it just means the SWR is not going to uh, hurt you that badly. So what the SWR is, it's a, a measure of uh, what's called forward power. Now that would be the power that you're sending out from your transceiver down the feed line to the antenna. And for a lot of reasons, uh, primarily the impedance match of your transceiver, the feed line, and the antenna um, if they aren't matched properly from an impedance standpoint, you'll get reflected power coming back. And it's that uh, forward power, measure of the forward power and a measure of the reflected power that uh, gives you uh, your standing wave ratio calculation or measurement. Uh, so it just makes sense, say, if you send out 100 watts and because of the setup, you're getting 30 watts back reflected to you. To your transceiver, then that means you're only getting 70 of the available 100 watts to radiate out the antenna. So as your SWR gets worse, the reflected power gets greater and greater and greater, so you're getting less power to the antenna. Um, 
So what happens is that the, the reflected and the forward power uh, generate what's called a, a uh, standing wave in the feed line. Um, and I've got a video to show you what that looks like, not in an antenna, but in a string system. That's one of the problems uh, with conceptually understanding antennas is it uh, can be difficult uh, to visualize the electromagnetic uh, fields. So uh, there's some good uh, mechanical analogs that we can use to kind of see what's going on. Uh, so that's what we're going to do next. Uh, we're going to take a look at um, reflections on waves. Now, the, the neat thing about waves is that uh, they all behave pretty much the same, uh, regardless of frequency. And uh, so we can use um, uh, this wave tank here to kind of see and understand what happens when a wave is reflected. Now, the way a wave tank is made is that it's uh, just a big open tub, I guess you would call it, with water in it. And uh, so you've got water up to some line here in the, the tub. And then what's going to happen is this board here is going to be vibrated up and down to make waves in the water. And then the waves are going to move across here and they're going to hit this item, which looks like a piece of plastic, and they're going to bounce, some of the waves are going to bounce back. And that's what happens in a, uh, an antenna system when you have less than unity, less than one, uh, or greater than one uh, standing wave ratio. That means some of the energy is going to reflect back. So uh, what will happen is when the video starts, the camera is going to move below the tank and you're going to see the shadows of the waves and uh, this obstacle here and then you'll be able to see the um, uh, wave uh, the reflected waves so i'll probably play this two or three times and uh, we'll just see how it works it's a pretty short video so hopefully i can get it going here see if this will work Oh, it worked when I practiced. Okay, here we go. Hope this works. See if I can get it going. Ah, it works. Okay, you should have seen the uh, reflected waves there. I'll go ahead and try running it again. Okay, well, I wasn't able to do what I wanted to do with that last video, but you can uh, slide the uh, slider back on the um, uh, YouTube video and watch it again if you'd like to. Um, this is, um, I thought, a, a pretty interesting graphic uh, to kind of show you what's going on inside uh, a dipole antenna, where um, what this is showing is we've got some voltage source. This would be your, your radio, and here's your feed line, and this is the dipole antenna. Now, the blue symbols are representing current. And you can see that the little arrows here are showing the current flow uh, in the antenna. So the current flow is going up, coming back, going up, coming back. And 180 degrees out of phase, the other side's doing the same thing. So what, um, what you're seeing in the, the blue here, this bump, is the current flow at that position of the dipole. So what this is showing you is that um, when the antenna is properly tuned, uh, we're at the resonant frequency and we're getting a good standing wave of half a wavelength, our current is concentrated more in the center of the antenna than out at the ends because you have no current flow out the end of the antenna because it's just open space. So out here at zero, 
uh, but your maximum current flow in a dipole is right here. Now what that means is if you remember when the current is flowing the the magnitude of the current determines the magnitude of the electromagnetic wave so you're going to get most of your propagation of the electromagnetic waves from the interior of the uh, the dipole antenna and not quite as much out here on the ends because the current flow is lower now the red is the voltage and you can see here if you watch these plus and minus signs they're switching back and forth uh, so that at the end of each dipole uh, element one's positive the other one's negative and then it switches when the current switches so you see that just going back and forth like that and then what the filled in uh, red area is is the magnitude of the voltage at that point so you can see that your highest voltage uh, values are at the end of the dipoles um, and your lowest voltage values are at the center of the, the dipole. You can see down here voltage is fairly low uh, even though it's uh, switching from uh, plus to minus every cycle and uh, it just kind of shows you what's going on with the waves. Now what happens with a, a frequency that you start changing away from this uh, tuned frequency is that the um, synchronization of these uh, the current and the voltage uh, so the, the standing waves start to become more and more uh, I don't I wouldn't say chaotic but they interfere more and more so you don't get that good uh, smooth standing wave that you're seeing here and that's what happens when you're reflective power starts increasing as you get off of the frequency and the reflective power is going back to uh, your receiver and not getting to the antenna and the, uh, the effectiveness of the radiated power drops off the farther away you get from that resonant frequency. Uh, so I just thought this was a pretty good uh, um, demonstration of that. I think I've got a second slide here that uh, is the same one but I've got some other information on it oh yeah it's just a reminder showing you here we look back on an earlier slide that it's the current flow that creates a magnetic field around the wire and that's what's happening here we're getting uh, electromagnetic uh, fields generated around these antenna elements and they're being propagated into space at the speed of light and that's what is carrying our radio information and it's the changing of the polarity uh, of the current that reverses the magnetic field. So our magnetic field is going positive to negative, positive to negative, just like the current voltage is doing. So the magnetic field tracks the, uh, the current uh, flow in an antenna. And by uh, regulating the current amount, we can regulate the intensity of that magnetic wave and that's what carries the information for our voice. So what we have here is a frequency generator. It's connected to what's called a wave driver. It's just a speaker. It's going to pump up and down at whatever frequency I set this guy to. When this guy pumps up and down, well, he sends a wave. He sends a wave down to this end, the wave reflects, comes back. Now, if I set it to just uh, any old frequency, let me just uh, turn this on. Well, yeah, let's go a little higher. So it's sending waves back and forth, but these waves are out of sync, if you like. They're, they're not exhibiting con consistently con So what we have here is a frequency generator. It's connected to what's called a wave driver. It's just a speaker. It's going to pump up and down at whatever frequency I set this guy to. When this guy pumps up and down, well, he sends a wave. He sends a wave down to this end. The wave reflects, comes back. Now, if I set it to just uh, any old frequency, let me just uh, turn this on. Well. Yeah, let's go a little higher. So it's sending waves back and forth, 
But these waves are out of sync, if you like. They're, they're not exhibiting con consistently constructive or destructive interference at any one point. But if I set it here, for example, I have what's called a standing wave. That is, the wave that's, that's sent down and reflects constructively interferes with the next wave that comes down right at this point. Now the waves that reflect, that come down and reflect, destructively interfere with the incoming waves right here. And that's called a node. I can touch it and it still is working. So the node is not moving. Here it's moving up and down, and here it's moving up and down. And we'll see that in a second with the high-speed camera. So here we have what's called the second harmonic. It's the second possibility for a standing wave for a string that's held at both ends. Because notice, this is a node, this is a node, and the middle's a node. So we have three nodes for this wave. Now, like I said, second harmonic, well, what's the first one? The first one will be half this number, so 8.5. And there we go. It's basically the scenario of a, of a jump. Now, I can find any of the other, harm, all of the other harmonics are multiples of this number. So we just saw that two times this number was the second harmonic, or the second possibility. Well, if I go three times this number, I should get the third harmonic. Well, three times 8.5, I guess that was that around 25.5. And there we go. So that's the third harmonic. How many wavelengths is this? Well, it's one and a half. One and one half wavelengths. And it's easier to see in high speed. So check out this shot with the high speed camera and uh, verify for yourself that it is one and one half wavelengths. <laughs> so again, third harmonic, one and a half wavelengths. Well, let's go to the sixth harmonic. The sixth harmonic will just be double this frequency, so we go up to 50, and there we go, that's the sixth harmonic.
Okay, now we're going to take a look at some uh, practical considerations necessary to uh, make uh, real-world antennas work. And um, first thing we're going to look at here is to compare a dipole with a vertical antenna. Um, let me get my laser pointer here. So here's a dipole, and uh, the feed line comes in the middle. And uh, you got two elements in the, uh, as we saw in some of the uh, graphics earlier, the current flows back and forth um, in this uh, dipole to generate our radiated energy. Now, the thing with a vertical antenna is that it's basically half a dipole. It would just be one element here pointing up in the air. And there are ways that uh, we have to uh, satisfy the condition of uh, what the the book referred to as an electrical image. Uh, we have to fake out uh, uh, the vertical part of the antenna into thinking that there's another uh, uh, companion on the other side that can uh, receive the energy that uh, it's pushing back and bringing back and forth. So there's several ways to do that. Uh, you can use a ground plane. Um, We'll talk about that a little bit, uh, counterpoise, uh, and uh, radials. Uh, radials are uh, uh, wires that are uh, uh, normally fanned out from the base of a vertical antenna uh, and can be just under uh, the uh, ground. Uh, so if you have to mow, you don't uh, get your wires tangled up in the lawnmower. But in some fashion, we've got to come up with a way to um, uh, generate the electrical image so we have um, good balance on the uh, uh, antenna. Now this is a uh, reproduction of the uh, the one uh, graphic that we were watching and the thing you notice is that there's a balance um, on each side of the dipole. And the, the best way I could describe it without being electrical on it is to consider it uh, like a bartender uh, that's mixing a drink with two glasses. Um, he's got to have a place for this fluid to go when he shakes it the other way or it's going to get all messy. And uh, that's kind of the what reason why um, we have need for ground planes, counterpoise, and uh, radials. So just some specifics of a uh, ground plane on a vertical. Um, this here is a vertical antenna. Um, it appears to be a two-band VHF UHF antenna. And the reason for that is I see two coils here that uh, act as traps, uh, which we'll get into probably in the general course on how all that works. Um, but it needs the balance, like uh, we were showing with the bartender. And one of the most common ways to achieve that um, uh, phantom uh, element is with a ground plane which could be the roof of your car. Uh, so a typical uh, application for uh, a vertical VHF UHF antenna or even an HF antenna would be to use a magnetic mount on the roof of your car and then that's your uh, phantom element at that point. Another thing you can do if you're using a handheld and want to improve the radiating efficiency of the uh, rubber duck antenna or any other antenna you add to it is to on the ground side of the uh, antenna connection just add a counterpoise wire about 19 or 20 inches and that could give you uh, better performance and then um, this is an example of a uh, permanent base station installation of a vertical antenna with, uh, and this is quite a few number of uh, radials heading out, uh, dispersed around the uh, antenna. Uh, taking a look at a couple directional antennas we uh, saw earlier, the, uh, the Yagi uh, antenna. And these are both Yagi antennas. This one is horizontally polarized because the uh, uh, radiating elements are horizontal. And then this one is vertically polarized because the vertical uh, radiating elements are vertical. 
so depending on uh, what you're trying to do uh, will determine whether you want to use horizontal polarization or vertical pol polarization and then this is just another look uh, bird's eye view or the drone view um, of what the radiating pattern of an antenna of this type would be where the uh, radiated energy is primarily concentrated in a big lobe out front with not much going on behind it. So you see little lobes here, but that's not a uh, much power. So this thing can see in uh, this direction real well, but it's kind of blind back here. It won't uh, hear anybody back behind it. Uh, another type of antenna you might see is a parabolic. Uh, this is common with the uh, microwave uh, work on ham radio. Also, uh, television, uh, satellite TV uses parabolic antennas. Uh, this is a large uh, parabolic antenna, probably out in the desert somewhere, uh, looking for extraterrestrials or whatever, kind of a radio telescope kind of thing. But the whole idea of a parabolic antenna is that the the surface, the reflecting surface, is a parabola, which is a curve that looks like this. And the uh, benefit of using a parabola is that if you have incoming signals coming in like this, they hit the parabola and reflect. And because of the way this angle is determined as a parabola, all of those signals are concentrated at a focal point here. So this is either the receiver and or transmitter here, and then the surface back here is used to reflect or to transmit um, and uh, focus uh, the signal. So uh, that's a type of antenna you might see. Uh, talk a little bit, uh, this is out of the book, on uh, power and uh, SWR meters. and. Uh, in this example here, it's showing that the way these things are hooked up, this is either an SWR meter or a watt meter, and uh, there are combinations. I have one that's both, I can switch it between SWR and power meter all in the same box, but it, uh, it's connected from the transceiver to the, uh, the box and then out to the antenna. And then this shows you the hookup for um, a, a transceiver to an antenna tuner. And what an antenna tuner does is it is adjusts the impedance between the radio and the antenna uh, to improve the standing wave ratio by matching the impedances um, that the radio sees. And it helps uh, protect the, uh, the radio from too much reflected power and it uh, reduces the, the uh, reflected power um, uh, to the an antenna. Most new uh, HF rigs have built-in uh, antenna tuners and uh, there's also need for an external antenna tuner. Uh, generally what I found with the, the rigs I have, um, if I have an, an SWR of three or lower, uh, the internal tuner has done a good job of uh, bringing that in uh, so I can operate effectively um, at that frequency. If you have an antenna whose SWR is much above three, I would suggest that you consider an external tuner that has a wider range of adjustments uh, so it can match wider uh, variations in impedances. And this is an example of a couple of antenna analyzers that you can use for uh, measuring uh, different parameters of an antennas. Uh, probably the most common measurement is the SWR, but there are a lot of other things that you can measure to give you better insight in your antennas. Um, in fact, I have a couple of YouTube videos on the air. If you just uh, search for um, K3SKS, uh, the first antenna, antenna analyzer video I have goes over um, uh, antenna analyzers in general um, for uh, ham radio applications and then the other one I think I was tuning a uh, uh, 
I was using this AA54 antenna uh, analyzer and uh, checking out one of my antennas to show you how that works. So uh, you could uh, Google uh, or go to YouTube and then just search for K3SKS and I've got that in several other videos out there that hopefully would be helpful. And finally, I uh, wanted to take a look at uh, what an SWR plot looks like on a real world antenna. Uh, this plot was generated by the uh, antenna analyzer on the right side of the last slide. And what this is, it's a graph. If you look at the vertical axis here, there's one right here, and it goes up, looks like, to six. And this is the standing wave ratio. And then the horizontal axis is the frequency, uh, where this is... Uh, this would be um, 40 meters here, 80 meters is here. And what you're seeing is the measured SWR at the, uh, in these frequency ranges. Uh, so this is um, a little bit below three. This one's about two and a half at 80 meters. So I could use my internal antenna tuner and uh, tune these in a little bit. And uh nice thing about the internal one, it's all automatic. Just push a button and it figures it out. Uh, here would be the uh, resonant frequency um, at uh, 20 meters, 17 meters, 10 meters. Uh, I don't know if this is 15 or yeah, it's probably 15. But these are showing you how the standing wave ratio changes as the frequency changes. And you can use this um, to gauge how well an antenna is running. Now this is uh, off of uh, a G5RV dipole antenna, which is a pretty popular uh, antenna that people use. Uh, the one thing that uh, is uh, like you like about it is that it can do multiple bands. So you can see there is some um, capability in just about every band, although the overall SWR is a little high uh, for my taste anyway. Uh, it is a good general antenna that you could use to get started. Uh, there are other multi-band uh, dipole variants that, that can give you a little bit better performance than this. Uh, but they get a little more expensive, a little more involved, whereas this is just a, uh, a good, uh, basic, uh, fairly cheap antenna. So uh, just something you might want to keep in mind. And I think that's about all I know about this stuff. So uh, I think I'll uh, close here and uh, look forward to getting Chapter 5 ready. So uh, this is K3SKS73, uh, and I'm clear.